Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Global Environmental Change section yeah. webinar today. And uh, we want to thank AGU for sponsoring this webinar. And uh, I would turn the mic to the past president of Global Environmental Change section, Alan Thompson, to introduce our speaker today. Thank you, Yuhan. So it's my pleasure to introduce the speakers for the webinar. They're going to discuss two approaches for mitigating global climate change, solar radiation management and greenhouse gas emissions reductions. We're all aware that global climate change poses many threats to our planet and to all life that resides there. But to date, we have not found the silver bullet needed to solve the problem. But collectively, humanity is busy developing lots of silver buckshot. We're going to hear some about some of that today. So we have two excellent speakers, and we want to thank Professors Robach and Brown for being here. First, we're going to hear from Dr. Alan Robach, who is a distinguished professor of climate science in the Department of Environmental Sciences at Rutgers University. His area of his areas of expertise include uh, climate intervention, we often call that geoengineering, climate effects of nuclear war, and the effects of volcanic eruptions on climate. Professor Robach will discuss stratospheric sulfur geoengineering benefits and risks. Welcome, Alan. Thank you very much for inviting me, Ellen, and uh, hi to everybody. I'm going to talk about uh, stratospheric sulfur geoengineering. Let me just first of all show what the issue is. This is global warming, and we can this is observations, and we can see that the planet has warmed over the last 140 years, but not evenly. In the first, uh, first of all, let's exclude these bad data from World War II. There was warming in the first part of the 20th century because there were a lot of volcanic eruptions that then stopped. And after World War II, there was a lot of tropospheric pollution, which blocked out the effects of greenhouse gases. But since then, the greenhouse gases have dominated. People have looked at this and said, well, you know, if volcanic eruptions can cool the climate, why don't we just do this artificially? Or if Pollution, if the troposphere is more reflective, why don't we do that? Maybe that can solve the problem of global warming. So this is the issue, this is my elevator speech about global warming. It's real, it's us, it's bad, we're sure, there's hope. <laughs> so here's the situation, we wanna be happy, so we get stuff, and stuff requires energy, and a lot of energy is produced by burning fossil fuels, coal, oil, and natural gas, which emits CO2. And about half of that stays in the atmosphere for a very long time, which causes climate change, which then has impacts on humans and ecosystems, most many of which are bad, and that's a negative feedback on our desire to be happy. So the question is, how do we break this cycle? We can do green things like not use as, have as much stuff or use energy more efficiently, or generate it from the wind and the sun. These are all green, this is what's called mitigation. Absent that, we can try two flavors of geoengineering or climate intervention. One is to take the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, and the other is to block the sunlight so it will to counteract the, the warming effect of carbon dioxide. Absent that, we have adaptation, and absent that, we have suffering. So, this is like treating the illness, uh, removing what's actually causing the problem. And this is more like treating the symptoms, like putting on a tourniquet. So that's the one I'm gonna talk about. That's the one I'm doing research on. What is geoengineering? The Royal Society defined it as deliberate large scale manipulation of the planetary environment to counteract anthropogenic climate change. So it's deliberate, it's large scale, and so if you drive your car today and it's not electric uh, and it emits CO2, that's causing climate change, but you wanted to get somewhere, so that's not geoengineering. It has to be deliberate. The US National Academy of Sciences five years ago had a report and they broke it up into two different books because they're really different. One was about carbon dioxide removal and the other was about solar ra radiation management, reflecting sunlight to cool Earth. And they call it climate intervention, not geoengineering. Why? Because they say if we use the term engineering, it sounds like we know what we're doing, that we can control it. 
So we're going to call it intervention, which is an action intended to improve a situation. And most people use that term now. The ideas about blocking the sunlight uh, are the main ones are putting something in space to reflect sunlight or creating an aerosol cloud in the stratosphere, which is the main to topic that most people study, or taking clouds in the lower atmosphere and putting salt particles in to make them brighter, or even brightening the surface. But it's the stratospheric aerosols that have gotten the most attention. We have the example of volcanic eruptions. This is not a new topic. In 1965, when Lyndon Johnson was president, there was a report of the Environmental Pollution Panel about the environment. And Appendix Y4, I'm sure you've all read it, uh, is uh, Roger Revell was the chair, and you'll know, recognize names like Wally Broker and Dave Keeling and Joe Smagorinsky. And they said uh, a change in the radiation balance in the opposite direction to that which might result from CO2 could be produced by raising the albedo or reflectivity of the Earth. 1965, for example, by spreading small reflecting particles over the ocean. In 1974, Mikhail Budika, the great Russian climatologist, proposed uh, by influencing the aerosol layer of the lower stratosphere, uh, stratospheric aerosol. So this has been a topic that's not new, but there hasn't been much work on it until uh, in 2006, Paul Crutzen wrote a paper that we should consider stratospheric aerosols. And he had, had just gotten his Nobel Prize in chemistry. People paid attention. And then Tom Wigley the same year published a paper in science with a, a simple climate model. And that sort of opened the floodgates and it wasn't taboo anymore and people started working on it. So NASA Ames that fall had an, a, a workshop uh, near San Francisco and I went to dinner with a friend of mine the night before and she said, look at Rolling Stone, you see the latest Rolling Stone? I said, yeah, yeah, John Stewart, Stephen Colbert. No, no, look at the top. Dr. Evil's plan to stop global warming. And inside there was an article about this guy, Lowell Wood, who was a right-hand man of Edward Teller, who was proposing that we control the climate. Forget a future filled with wind farms and hydrogen cars. He says a radical solution would stop global warming no matter how much oil we burn. So I went to this meeting and uh, it was in a room and, and people were, the engineers and physicists were saying what a cool idea it was to make particles and reflect sunlight. And it was a little too warm in the room and somebody walked over to try and adjust the thermostat and they couldn't figure out how to do it. <laughs> so the irony was lost on many people that they were trying to control the environment of the whole planet and they couldn't uh, make one room the temperature they wanted. So I started writing down reasons why that maybe this isn't such a good idea. And I ended up with 20 reasons and I published a paper in 2008. And since then my list now is 28 reasons. And somebody told me, well, you got to put the benefits too. So you shouldn't count, if you're going to make a decision whether or not to do this, you shouldn't count the number on each list. You should evaluate each one so that society can make informed decisions. So number one benefit, if you could reduce sunlight, it would re reduce surface air temperatures and many of the impacts of global warming, uh, more extremes, uh, stronger storms, sea ice melting. Is it worth living with all of these risks so that we can get this benefit? And other potential benefits, increased plant productivity, increased terrestrial CO2 sink, beautiful sunsets. So I don't have time in this short talk to go over all of these, so I'll just discuss a few of these things on the list. And if, if you're interested in uh, learning more, here are some papers. I have published one in 2020, you can get from my website, which discusses this. So uh, how do we do this? Well, one way is with climate modeling. As we know, uh, the lab, our laboratory is the whole Earth, and we don't want to mess with it, uh, uh, and we can't. So we use climate models. And we st started a geoengineering model intercomparison project uh, to, to do this. And this can answer the ones in red, including all these physical effects like increased drought, uh, ozone depletion, uh, acid rain, uh, ice sheets, and rapid warming if it stops, and some of the impacts. So. Uh, some of the proposals were to put particles in the tropical stratosphere and the winds would spread them around the world like we observe after big volcanic eruptions like Mount Pinatuba in 1991. Or maybe we should put them in the Arctic just to uh, reflect sunlight and save the sea ice. So uh, 
this is a cartoon for those of you that don't know what a climate model is. Uh, you in, in grid boxes, you calculate all the terms of energy coming in and out and winds and ocean currents. And it's the same thing we use to make weather forecasts every day. We just keep it going longer and we include things that change more slowly like the oceans. So, whoops. Uh, so this was the result of our, uh, of our first simulation. We wanted to see, this is the global warming I just showed you. We did business as usual. We put three teragrams, three megatons of SO2 per year into the Arctic stratosphere, or five megatons per year into the tropics, or 10 megatons per year into the tropics for 20 years, and then we stopped. Mount Pinatuba put about 20 megatons of SO2 into the atmosphere once, but then it originally it quickly started to go away. So this, this dip right here, is the effect of Mount Pinatubo. But if you leave it there, it builds up, the ocean gradually cools. And so for the five megatons, the temperature goes down like this. 10, it goes down like this. <clears throat> In the Arctic, it doesn't stay as long, so the effect is less. But then if you stop, after about a year, it falls out and you get this rapid warming. This brings up several questions. Let's say we could do this, which we don't have the technology to do. Let's say we could. What temperature do we want? How do we want to set the planetary thermostat? We want to keep the temperatures as they are today, or uh, 1980 levels, or 1880 levels, and who decides? And then if you stop, you get this much more rapid warming, faster than you would get from the gradual warming we're getting now. But it's not just global averages. This is the precipitation response for the second 10 years of, of the run for Northern Hemisphere summer, and you get a reduction of precipitation over India, over China, and so if the summer monsoon fails, do you really want to do that even if you're making the warming less? Other people did this simulation, but they did different experiments. We had this gradual increase and in, in this NCAR, they did two times CO2. So this was our, the figure I just showed you with a different uh, color scale, blue is reduction of precipitation uh, and the NCAR got a different pattern. So we said, you know, we really want to, uh, do the same experiment for all the models. So we established the Geoengineering Model Intercomparison Project, GeoMIP. It's almost 100 papers now have been published uh, based on GeoMIP scenarios, and it's part of CMIP 5 and CMIP 6, and the latest simulations are coming in, and we're still continuing to analyze them. So I'm not going to go through 95 papers. I'm just going to show you a couple of them. Our first meeting was at, at Rutgers, and this is Ben Kravis, my former student, and now is a professor at Indiana University, and people that came to the, the Phil Rash, Simone Thames, uh, Peter Irvine, Carl Taylor, uh, Ron Stauffer, people you might recognize. And every year we've had Olivier Boucher, uh, uh, Hoke Schmidt, every, every year we've had uh, workshops at Exeter, at Potsdam, and then I said to uh, Olivier, can we have the next one in springtime in Paris? He said, sure, so that's what we did. And then at these workshops, we analyze past results and we plan new experiments. The next year we had one at NCAR where we had postdocs and students too, so it was a bigger workshop. And we had one in Oslo and as part of the Gordon Research Conference in Maine and then at ETH in Zurich and last and then last year in China with remarkably blue skies. <laughs> uh, and then this year we did it with Zoom. <laughs> we were planning to meet in person but we couldn't. So uh, Ben and I and Ulrich and Niemeyer are the only three that have been to all, all of them. We don't know about next year. We're going to try and meet in person, but presumably the next Gordon Research Conference, which was supposed to be this year, has been delayed by two years. We'll have a, a meeting there. So please come. The experiments that we did were to uh, uh, take the runs that were being done as part of CMIT 5 and on top of that, turn the sun down, either by turning the sun down or putting aerosols in the stratosphere. So we decided to pick these runs that all the climate modelers were doing, RCP 4.5, 1% per year CO2, abrupt four times CO2. And we wanted to make it easy for them. We didn't even know how many modelers would volunteer to do it, but a bunch of them did. So our G1 experiment was the models are doing four times CO2. Let's just turn the sun down to balance the forcing. So you're getting the net forcing is zero, but you're heating with greenhouse gases and cooling 
with solar reduction, this affects the surface of Earth, this affects the whole troposphere. And so it's not the same. What are the effects? And then 1% per year CO2 and then stop after 50 years, look at the termination problem. Or put in aerosols, uh, which most models couldn't do at the time, now they can, and examine the effects also of aerosols in the stratosphere, which would heat the stratosphere, destroy ozone, change the temperature gradient, and, and so this is a more sophisticated, more realistic uh, if we ever do it, or do it for 50 years. So let me look at one of the experiments from G1 that Simone Tilms led. Let's look at what would the effect would be on, on the summer monsoons. We took the last 40 years of the simulations. So first of all, what is a monsoon? A monsoon is a region where the most of the precipitation comes at one time of the year, not all year long like where I live in New Jersey. So there's a summer monsoon in India, in China, in Africa, even in Southwest US. And so what she did is she looked at the different regions. And so the let's look at the red for land for India. Four times CO2 gives an increase of summer monsoon. G1, which is, re, which is a balancing, the forcing actually gives a reduction of just like we found in our model. And if you look at all the other summer monsoons, in almost every case, you do get summer monsoon precipitation reduction. So it's a really robust result from all these models. Uh, Andy Jones led a paper on the G2 experiment, so 1% per year increase of CO2 balanced by reduction of insulation. So these are the results for temperature. The dotted lines are how the model's temperature went up without any geoengineering. The solid lines are what happens if you gradually reduce the sunlight and try and keep the temperature from going up. Most models were successful at that. When you stop, you get this very rapid warming. This purple line is the Chinese model, they only got about half of the half of the reduction of warming. But then if you look at global average precipitation, temperature doesn't change, precipitation goes down. This is a very robust result because the atmosphere becomes more stable with the greenhouse gases. And so you can't control temperature and precipitation at the same time. This purple line is the one that had some small warming, but it, it, so it controlled precipitation. And there's an experiment we did looking at the termination uh, impacts, not just on humans, but on ecosystems. And so we took four models that had done the G4 experiment and looked at the effect on, on uh, ecosystems. And so this is the results of temperature for G4 over land, uh, warming for our CP 4.5, uh, cooling. Uh, there's an implementation phase, a termination phase, and then it was a little bit cooler. We looked at climate velocity for organisms. How fast can you walk to keep the same temperature? Say the temperature is warming, you'd have to go toward the pole or up a mountain. So this is from Alice in Wonderland. Uh, uh, it keeps all the running you do to keep in the same climate space. And so that's what we analyzed. And for if you the lower left is the past climate velocity for temperature. And the orange is about 10 kilometers per year that's happening now and will happen in the future with RCP 4.5. With termination, you get much higher climate velocities. And this bottom curve is where the climate velocity for temperature and precipitation are in different directions. So you can't go, can't stay in one space. You have to go one direction or the other direction. And the speed is twice what you would have gotten without, uh, uh, without any geoengineering. And so, we really find uh, fracturing of ecosystems of climate niches, especially where there are uh, uh, important species. And so uh, uh, because of this, uh, if there was termination and people say, well, you know, that would be stupid to stop it right at once. But uh, you can think of scenarios where uh, that would happen, where, where uh, uh, the technology uh, ended uh, broke or people demanded that you stop because they thought you were being they were being badly affected by it. Now there's another experiment called Glens, which has been done at NCAR, where they did uh, tried to balance RCP 8.5 with uh, uh, increasing sulfate aerosols, and and so they were able to uh, uh, do a pretty good job keeping the temperature from warming. 
But at the same time, precipitation went down. And they had to continually put more and more sulfur in. So by the end of the century, they were putting, you know, three or four or five Pinatubo eruptions every year worth of sulfur. And if you look at the temperature pattern, uh, this is what you would get with doing nothing. This is what you would get with the geoengineering. Clearly, there's much less warming. But this is a temperature scale of 0 to 10 Kelvin. If you change a temperature scale to 0 to 2, you get this region of a lot of warming uh, because of the enhanced Arctic oscillation advection of air onto Europe. And so, you, again, in other places, cool. So, again, you can't control every place. So this is the way that it might be implemented if it ever is. This is called the napkin diagram. It was drawn by John Shepard in an Asilomar conference more than 10 years ago. Business as usual. Let's do a mitigation as much as we can. And then let's try and suck the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, carbon dioxide removal. And if we can do that, we still might get this much warming. And, but, if we think two degrees above pre-industrial is dangerous, maybe we'll do some solar radiation management for time period to reduce the warming. Absent that, we have adaptation and suffering. So if it's ever, and he actually labeled the axes. Nowadays, people are, don't do that. But you see, this would still imply 100 years or more of SRM. So Simone Tilms led another experiment with the NCAR model where they actually did that, kept the temperature at uh, uh, two, two degrees above normal or one and a half degrees uh, above pre-industrial. And, uh, but that would still destroy ozone because you're heating the stratosphere and you would get a lot less ozone and more UV at the surface. All the output from GeoMIP and GLENS is sitting on disk if anybody wants to analyze it. There's a lot more papers that can be written based on this. In fact, there's a decimals fund where eight groups in developing countries are using these outputs to look at their local impacts. So what about using vol the volcano analog? I spent a lot of time doing that. I'll just show you a couple examples. Uh, this is a paper by Kevin Trenberth and I go die. They looked at the precipitation pattern after the Pinatubo eruption. And indeed, they found a reduction of precipitation over India and China and also the Amazon. So this may have been an El Nino signal, but th these are pretty robust with the climate models. So that also teaches us that this is a potential problem. So volcanoes teach us that you can cool the surface, reduce ice melt, sea level rise, but you would reduce summer monsoon precipitation, destroy ozone, produce rapid warming when it stops, make the sky white, reduce solar power, and affect remote sensing. So finally, uh, these other things on my list you can't test with modeling or the volcano analog and these are governance issues which i think are very difficult how do you decide what temperature you want would there be disruption if people can't agree would some big company be in charge uh would there be a uh, human error during implementation anybody that wrote, was in a car recently and wore their seatbelt understands this concept anything made by humans operated by humans can fail so God forbid you have a car accident, the seatbelt or the what will save you. But uh, what about uh, putting a, a very complicated uh, system covering the climate of the whole planet? It's also not hard to think of examples like the uh, Boeing 737 MAX or the Fukushima nuclear power plant of complex systems that, that fail. So we're governed by the Framework Convention on Climate Change, which prevents dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system. When it was put in, we thought that that was due to the effects of greenhouse gases, but I think we have to include geoengineering now in our pledge to prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system. And so uh, the question then is if we do it, even if we do it this way, does SRM make it more dangerous? And that's what we're doing research to figure out. So I hope that we will have these beautiful sunsets. This is after Krakatau, only after volcanic eruptions for a long time to come. Thanks. Thank you very much, Alan. Um, yep. <laughs> um, we have about five minutes for questions. We're going to do questions for Alan, and then we'll have questions for Marilyn after her presentation. So if you want to put those in the question box, uh, that, that would be great. 
think it's called chat at the bottom. Oh, there's a chat. That's While we are still waiting for questions. Well, we, um, have, we have a question. Yuhan? Yes, uh, we have one question from Mark Mutlin, uh, the estimate of costs for the geoengineering, I'm assuming. So if you wanted to do that today, you couldn't. The technology doesn't exist. But there are some designs for airplanes that can, new airplanes that be invented that can fly high enough to get into the stratosphere. And uh, you'd also have to figure out how to create particles that are the right size so that they would reflect sunlight and not fall out too quickly. But if you could do it, it would be billions of dollars a year, which is much cheaper than changing the entire global energy system. So the direct cost would be cheap and, and the effect would be pretty quick. So, but when you talk about costs, you have to also have to talk about the indirect costs of all those risks. What are the what are the other all the other things on the list, not just the direct cost? We have another question about um, asking if you if you incorporate the sunspot cycles into the modeling. The sunspot cycle is in all the climate models. It's it's an eleven year cycle, and uh, the the up and down of solar constant is very small. It's a very small effect compared to the huge radio forcing you get from greenhouse gases and the huge radio forcing you would get from stratospheric aerosol. So it's in there, but it's it's a, it, it's part of the noise. And it, and there's no long-term trend in the solar forcing either. So the, another question is are there harmful other are there harmful effects from from the uh, SO2? Other health yeah. effects, for example. Yeah, so anything that goes up comes down and so it would come out as acid rain. It would come out as uh, acid snow and when by burning fossil fuels right now we're putting about 50 million tons of so2 into the atmosphere as a byproduct and that's the most uh common that's the largest source of tropospheric pollution and it produces haze it's concentrated mostly in places where you burn the fuels because the lifetime in the troposphere is only about a week if you put it in the stratosphere the lifetime is about a year and so it would fall out around the world, specifically in in uh, bands of, of in, along the jet stream. But some of it falls out over ice cores. That's how we have records of past volcanoes, as Ellen well knows. Uh, but the dep deposition on ice cores is less than the global average. So we've calculated how much additional acid rain you would get. And even in pristine areas, which aren't affected now, you would get a little bit more, but it wouldn't be that much. And, and uh, Projection scenarios of future global warming have reduction of SO2 emission as we as we uh, clean up the atmosphere. For example, ships now are no longer to burn high diesel fuel, and it's cheaper for them just to have one tank, and so they're polluting less. And so it is still there would be some effects because you'd be breathing more of this haze, and it's not good for you. But not, people don't think that that's a major problem, but it, it is something to consider. We have time for one more question. And there's a question regarding ocean acidification. What would be the impact on that and on and on ecosystems? Even if carbon dioxide didn't cause global warming, we should stop putting it in the atmosphere because of the terrible damage it does to the ocean. It produces ocean acidification and it's continuing to do that even if we stop emitting it, the, as the ocean comes into balance, it will get more acidic. But if you look at the effect of the sulfuric acid from using SO2 as a as the chemical, it would be much less than the effects of CO2 on the ocean. All right. Well, we'll close this this set of questions. We're, we'll come back at the end after Marilyn answers questions, and we'll have a round robin for both of them. So, okay. Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Alan. Sure. My pleasure. Yeah. And if anybody wants a copy of my talk, just let me know and I'll, I'll give it to you. It's I'll a lot more slides I didn't have time to show. <laughs> I'll have an email out to you probably within the hour. Okay, great. <laughs> so now we're going to hear from Dr. Marilyn Brown. She's a Regents professor and she's currently the interim chair of the School of Public Policy at Georgia Institute of Technology. And there she created and now leads the Climate and Energy Policy Laboratory. 
Professor Brown's research focuses on the design and modeling of carbon reduction technologies, policies, and programs. So welcome, Marilyn. We're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, Ellen. Hey, I have a technical question. When you look at my uh, at this uh, screen, are you seeing a big uh, picture of yourself and me? Or at the top. do I need to move that away? I'll move that over there. Okay, now you're seeing the entire screen, right, with my first slide? Yeah. Marilyn, uh, everything's fine. You can go ahead with your presentation. All right, thanks so much. So um, on behalf of the four university team that is part of the Drawdown Georgia project, I'm going to talk with you about a very different topic, which is the uh, emission reductions of greenhouse gases as a strategy for ta tackling global climate change. And in particular, the um, met a methodology that's been developed to translate a global emissions reduction framework to suit the needs of subnational uh, governments such as states and localities, because we all know that there's no one size fits all solution for. Oh, there we go. All right, to tackle climate change. So I'm going to start with um, the um, reduction goals set forth in this uh, recent update of the McKinsey project that shows the requirement for immediate action in order to meet goals such as a 1.5 degree C um, reduction um, in global warming above pre-industrial levels of temperatures. So this 1.5 degree C goal, for those of you that don't easily go between centigrade and Fahrenheit, is the equivalent of 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit, and that's what we're going to be talking about. So we are going to look at the Drawdown Georgia approach to tackling um, the state's issues of reducing its 120 or so million ton carbon uh, footprint. We're going to start by looking at the Project Drawdown framework that was led by Paul Hawken and published in the year 2017 which uh, looked at opportunities available across the globe to reduce greenhouse gases. So this is their top 100 or so list that is divided into major sectors of the economy. And the question for um, any particular state or locality is going to be what is best for it? So how do you know what options on this list to select? So, this is a little bit of the methodology that we've developed. We uh, started this project two years ago with funding from the Racy Anderson Foundation um, and immediately got um, buy-in from stakeholders and groups around the state to help us make this an inclusive project and for uh, us to be permeable to all kinds of views that are out there. So we did surveys, we did uh, classes, eight classes over the past year across four universities, got students engaged, we had uh, <laughs> radio shows and weather geek podcasts, so we did social media, et cetera. So lots of engagement. And um, that produced a, a step down system of uh, selection that is based on five questions. The first question is whether or not the solution is uh, technology and market ready for the state of Georgia. And in this instance, for instance, we felt that autonomous vehicles uh, and um, high-speed rail are technologies that are not ready. We asked a question if there is local experience for which uh, Georgians could make an a informed decision. And in some cases, that's not available, like wave and tidal energy being tried in the UK and in the Pacific Northwest, but not much here in the, in the uh, Southeast US states. Uh, does the solution provide for a megaton reduction of CO2 by the year 2030? So we picked that threshold looking at the state's uh, CO2 
uh, footprint of about 100 million tons and thought that anything less than a million ton would not be um, important enough to to make an initiative out of. So we eliminated a lot of what are very uh, interesting topics, including, for instance, micro wind. In Georgia, we don't have a lot of wind. Alternative uh, cement, which just doesn't deliver enough uh, emissions reductions because there's not enough cement used. Uh, and, and living buildings or net zero buildings, we don't build new buildings rapidly enough to, by the end of a decade, have uh, set aside another megaton of CO2 emissions. And then we go to our fourth question, which is whether or not the uh, solution is cost competitive. So here, three of them drop out. For instance, uh, solar power towers are otherwise called concentrated solar, solar water heating, biomass power. And we ended up with 20. 20 high impact solutions for the state of Georgia. And that's what I want to a focus on today as we then drill down further into the 20 um, high impact solutions to determine their uh, the best way to activate them. So this is our set. I love this uh, grouping because it includes um, a number of solutions that are available to all of us citizens who can uh, reduce the meat content of their diets, they can engage in alternative mobility, they can put rooftop solar on their homes, but it also includes technologies that need to be adopted by industry and businesses like cogeneration at pulp and paper mills and chemical plants and in food processing. Uh, and also those types of technologies that need uh, public investment like mass transit, can't do it without the government weighing in. So for each of those 20, we tried to characterize them in a way that's um, meaningful to the Georgia populace. So what would it take to save a megaton of carbon uh, in Georgia through rooftop solar? Well, you'd have to add about 300,000 new five kilowatt systems on homes by the year 2030. Uh, there are uh, fewer than 5,000 now. You'd need to compost uh, 2 million tons of organic waste from landfill um, by 2030. You need to eliminate 2.5% of car trips by 2030. So this was kind of a, a handy little metric that we uh, have been deploying and found quite useful in making these things more um, realistic and, and human scale. But for our modeling, we needed to look at different future scenarios that would move these 20 solutions forward and try to characterize what the possibilities are. So you start with the baseline forecast. You need to know what the future would be for each of these 20 uh, solutions if there's no new action. This is a no new action scenario. Status quo, um, plus slow change and continued trends. On the other hand, uh, we can bound the future possibilities by looking at what's technically potential. So what's the maximum realistic application of these 20 solutions? Uh, where you uh, set aside questions of cost, but consider limitations such as available land. So here, for instance, you could cover every south facing flat roof with solar panels, and uh, that would produce one type of technical maximum potential. Um, and the achievable potential for the year 2030, we thought was something in between. So here we're looking at realistic scenarios that do put costs back into the equation, consider impact, stakeholder acceptance, look at what regulations and policies would need to be changed and come up with an estimate of what might be achieved. So here, as an example, um, EVs becoming 15% of new sales by 2030. I personally think that's too, too low a goal, but that's what our transportation engineers came up with. And growing large-scale solar from 1 to 11% of the electricity generated in the state of, in the state of Georgia. <clears throat> so 
We did this for all 20 solutions and um, put them onto our wedge diagram. So a common approach to portraying uh, reduction potentials. First, recognizing that Georgia has a lot of forests and carbon in uh, the organic content of ag soils. So 46 million tons of carbon sinks currently exist, but we think that we could, we could have more. So we start with that 120 million ton um, baseline, which is declining to 122 on that in the status quo business as usual case. But then when you overlay the reductions possible by our 20 solutions, you get down to 43 million ton reduction or 35% reduction of that footprint to 79 million tons. This, by the way, is a calculator. And in less than a month, it'll be up on our website called a Drawdown GA. So come and look at it. You can play with it. You can um, add any combination of the solutions that you want at different levels and see what happens to the state of Georgia. Um, here, solar farms and energy efficient trucks were the two big biggest winners in the um, achievable case. But then you move to what's technically possible and you see different solutions coming in and you actually could bring emissions down uh, below net zero. So here we have a case where we're 11% below um, zero by the year 2030 if the technical potential were all to be exploited. We've got the addition of alternative mobility in a big way, uh, retrofitting also another big wedge, and afforestation and silvopasture pasturing in um, a forest and pastures. And then we have the two solar solutions, solar uh, rooftop and solar farms. So that makes up the bulk of these emission reductions, but every little wedge also makes a difference and is to be nurtured. Um, and then we move to the standard carbon abatement cost curve. So now we array each of these 20 solutions on a um, horizontal axis that ranges from uh, you know, zero CO2 emission reductions to uh, more than 45 million tons. Each, the width of each bar is the CO2 reduction potential of each solution. And where you see lines dividing, it means that we have a high and a low estimate. On the vertical axis, we array the abatement cost, which is dollars per ton CO2 in the year 2030. And the uh, left side has our um, negative cost solutions, that is the solutions that save you money the most, reduced food waste being the big winner, Rooftop solar and cogen, also large um, net negative solutions. On the right side, you see those solutions that have the biggest costs. Uh, electric vehicles and mass transit are at the uh, far right. And then you have an array of costs for large scale solar that include negative to positive. So you add all this up and you take into account the fact that there are ranges both in terms of the costs and in terms of the magnitudes of abatement possible, achievable in this case by 2030. And that gives you a total cost for this 20 solution future scenario, which ranges from a cost of 140 million to benefits of 12 billion in the year 2030. I like to hover around the middle section here, in particular, the land sinks, which are all uh, very affordable, net, net cost of about $2 per ton CO2, but delivering some reasonably significant uh, carbon reduction to their um, absorption. 
All right. So that was our abatement cost curve. The abatement um, curves of the past have, like the one I showed you, um, have tended to be additive. Ours is not additive. We can we reflect interactions between solutions. So as an example, here's a, we call this our chord diagram. All 20 solutions are here and we show how they're linked. Some of the biggest linkages are between large scale solar and other um, solutions, in particular electric vehicles, I'll talk with you about in a minute, and uh, retrofitting. But there are other very interesting um, interactions to keep in mind all of the um, transportation options are well interconnected. So if you um, want to know how they're connected, you do some modeling. And we did that, for instance, looking at the achievable scenarios in 2030 for uh, both large scale solar and electric vehicles. So for large scale solar, let's see if I can go back. Um, you see, we've got about 11 million tons here. And electric vehicles, we've got about two and a half or uh, so a million tons. So the EV contribution to carbon reduction is increased by 1.4 million tons if that electricity has more solar content, right? It's low carbon. You're saving, you're using a fuel now which has less carbon content. The opposite is true for retrofitting. Here, the two solutions compete with one another. Uh, the more solar energy you have generating the electricity that's used in buildings, the less you save when you retrofit those buildings. This is kind of a sad finding because I am very, spent a lot of time on energy efficient buildings. I don't think that in any way it should uh, dissuade anyone from retrofitting because you also save money and you do save CO2. So I'm going to go through very quickly two uh, of the electricity sector solutions just to show you, give you a sense of how we went about evaluating these. Let's take the um, case of rooftop solar. So many are interested in this. I thought it would be um, fun to walk through this. So we have um, in the state of Georgia, not as much solar as in New Jersey. This is one of the biggest uh, solar rooftop um, leaders in the country. But we do have a sum and we are um, growing rapidly. We have solarized programs in seven or eight cities across the state. And these programs have been responsible for much of the uptake by both homes and also businesses. You can see the uh, rapid acceleration of the marketplace over time. We looked at a uh, Google solar Google rooftop solar uh, data in order to get a technical potential for rooftop solar in Georgia. And this is defined as all south facing and flat roofs getting solar. And that delivers 12.1 uh, million ton, tons of abatement. So if we take the current rate of growth and put it onto a logistic curve, you've got every the three parameters, you got your start point, you got your acceleration, and you have your asymptote, and you can estimate where we'll be in the year 2030. And our estimate is that in the year 2030, we will be able to offer the state of Georgia an opportunity to reduce its carbon footprint by one megaton through this uh, increase in, in rooftop solar. So what is it going to cost? You might remember this was one of the um, negative cost options, saves you money. Uh, we're here looking at a case where solar costs have been uh, dropping very rapidly at about a 20% learning rate, doubled the production, the costs dropped by 20%. So we fitted curves to see where we might be in 2030, continue that um, 
that learning curve. And this is the estimated solar system capital cost in the year 2030 with that trajectory of costs uh, continuing to improve. So you'd spend $9,500 on a five kilowatt system, which is about what I have. I've got a seven kilowatt system. I paid a bit more. We haven't seen the cost declines completely yet. So, uh, but here you can see that that investment, even including a thousand in finance fees and annual payments, would, uh, after paying off the upfront cost, save the building owner, the homeowner, $7,600 over the 25 year lifetime of the system. So it's not an enormous price per year. You know, we're talking $300 or something like that, savings a year, but it is a savings. So it's a win win. It's a double dividend, as we call them in the industry. And I wanted to turn to the demand side of energy, and I've got two slides um, on demand side response, which is a form of smart energy efficiency. This is not the kind of energy efficiency that requires cold showers and warm beer. This is smart energy efficiency. You don't even know you're taking advantage of it. And the focus of demand response is to clip those peaks of consumption in your daily use and move it to the valleys of consumption because here utilities can deliver that electricity much cheaper and it is cleaner than the peaking um, power that's purchased on hot summer afternoons. So all sectors, all customer classes benefit from uh, demand response. Georgia businesses would benefit more than homeowners or industry because the commercial sector uses more electricity to meet its uh, energy requirements than any other sector. And the savings of shifting, and we used a, uh, the National Energy Modeling System, which is a computable general equilibrium model of the US energy economy. Um, so we are doing all, all interactions are absorbed within these numbers, including price changes, consumption changes, um, and interactions across fuels. And here the estimate for businesses in Georgia would be that they could save $15 million each year over the decade in this achievable case. And that's partly because for those of you who may not know what kind of is what kind of uh, generation meets our peaks, it's the nasty stuff. It's single cycle uh, systems uh, often sometimes even uh, petroleum based, but typically uh, gas, but highly inefficient. So this brings me to uh, some of the same air pollution uh, issues that you heard about from Alan. Uh, here we've got lower uh, sulfur dioxide and NOx levels coming from the same uh, solution, which means fewer respiratory illnesses, lower incidence of low birth weight, autism spectrum disorder. We as adults have fewer premature deaths, heart attacks, respiratory illnesses lots of benefits. And when we use the standard uh, monetization per a ton of these pollutants, taking into account where the pollution is occurring, because this is by county in the 159 counties of the state of Georgia, the total benefit from reducing the local pollutants is 21 million in 2030. And the cost of uh, social cost of carbon estimate for saving the CO2 would be 123 million in, in uh, 2030. I better keep going. We could pause on that and talk a lot more about that. But let me turn to in the future, we've got a uh, commitment now for another two years of funding. We're going to look at um, the greenhouse gas footprints of all of Georgia's counties and metro areas. 
it's a it's a great sample size, these 159 counties. We're going to attempt to promote gamification and beneficial competition as occurred when I did the uh, carbon footprints of the nation's 100 largest metro areas for the Brookings Institute about 10 years ago. Wow, it created so much give and take between metro areas in the United States, defending themselves. No, no, it's not that you're wrong. Uh, boasting, you know, for being at the top of the list, the clean, some of the cleaner cities. Uh, and that's what we want to do is get people aware of their impact and know how they stand relative to others. We're engaging business. We're going to create a carbon club of Georgia businesses. And we're going to look at how to evaluate, plan, and track activation on five specific solutions. So with that, I think I probably will um, come to an end and invite you all to stay in touch if you'd like to hear more uh, about this project. Thank you. Thank you, Marilyn. So what we're going to do now is take just a few minutes to have questions that have come in specifically for Marilyn, and then after that, we'll open it up. So uh, a question, is the cost of electricity from solar energy more stable and predictable? And is that a benefit for residential and commercial uh, applications? Ooh, that's a complicated question. Um, it, yes, the the um, availability and cost of solar energy, <laughs> solar radiation, is more predictable than the marketplace for uh, coal, gas, oil, and you know other commodity prices, uh, biomass, etc. Um, but then, of course, the sun doesn't always shine, and so during the course of the day and over the seasons you do have to worry about reliability and backup power generation. So one of the reasons that this cost of solar farms was not more favorable is because you do at the moment need to back them up with natural gas peaking so that you can immediately respond. And this is efficient peaking. This is a two cycle type modern uh, turbines to back up the solar. Eventually, hopefully, it will be backed up more by uh, lithium ion batteries or some other form of battery storage or storage such as, uh, you know, there, there are many, many kind of time, types that we could talk about. Another question is, does the Georgia analysis account for anticipated growth in economic activity and energy use? Yes, because we use the uh, National Energy Modeling System, it uses the um, um, the growth forecast of IHS, which is one of the two principal um, GDP and growth um, forecasters in the world. So it's yeah, it's I have to pay twelve thousand dollars to get that forecast every year <laughs> to embed it into the software. So I hope it's right. <laughs> so another question, how is Downdraw Georgia related to Project Downdraw run by Jonathan Foley in San Francisco? Is there a widespread national network of drawdown programs developing? Oh, that's a great question. Good. Uh, we in Georgia have the first statewide deep dive into translating Project Drawdown, which is John Foley's uh, global project to a U.S. state. So we are the, really the only one that's brought this to this level of maturity. There are many other states that are talking about it. Some have begun. Uh, they're not as well resourced as our effort has been, and we are planning. So Georgia is like a microcosm of the U.S., and we've got coastlines, we have mountains, we have ag and um, we have forests. We've got a very large world-class city and lots of other urban and rural you know, places. So we are a bit like Ohio, but I think maybe our mountains are higher and we do have a coastline. <laughs> but, um, you know, so we think that what we're learning here in Georgia could translate, it could provide 
some, um, at least the methodology certainly could be useful elsewhere and maybe some of the specifics about each solution as well. Another question regarding food waste, is this referring primarily to spoilage in our kitchens or the waste or to waste of food as it's being produced and brought to the store for purchase? Yeah, um, and there's also waste at the farm. So it's really all of that, but the biggest waste is at the grocery stores. Okay. So that's, uh, but, but this particular initiative, which uh, Suda Harmani from the University of Georgia has led for us, has identified programs for all three of those sources of waste. So really it's all, the solution is multi-pronged um, as is the all problem. Right. <laughs> we'll have just one more question and then we're gonna open it for both you and Alan. Um, let's see, there are a lot of questions. So one person comments, cool project, Marilyn. Thank you. I'm surprised at the high abatement cost of EVs. The operating cost is so much lower than gas-powered vehicles. Wouldn't the reduction in gas use offset the increased consumption of fossil-based electricity? Yeah, so um, EVs in Georgia um, are uh, offsetting uh, you know, gasoline. They do use um, electricity that does have content, some carbon content to it, still has a lot of coal and gas, um, but the estimated cost that Rich, Dr. Rich Simmons and Dr. Mike Rogers, both in uh, mechanical engineering and the Transportation Research Center there, have, they've put together the modeling and they uh, are estimating these costs, partly thinking that the electricity demands of a large uptake of EVs could cause um, prices to rise. And that's part of the um, negative impact. But they also have said that prices are declining and the next decade is likely to show EVs on the opposite side of the equation. All right. Well, thank you very much, Marilyn. And then um, it is a little bit after, but my understanding is that we have the webinar for a little more time if people would like to stay around. Um, let me see. I want to go back to some of the other questions that came in. Uh, just give me a minute. Could I ask you, Marilyn, a question? Sure. Yeah. I was wondering how you account for the background carbon sink from Georgia forests. Is it because they're rapidly growing? Because as I understand it, a mature forest uh, oh. takes up CO2 from photosynthesis, but gives off CO2 from respiration. And the, the net, net sink is very small. So we are um, first at 46 million tons of CO2 is um, the current sink. So there, um, the um, organic matter in soils is considered fairly permanent. The uptake in uh, the forestry has some permanent um, benefits to it. It's not, I know, of course, there's this, you know, CO2 cycle, and so it comes and goes, but more of it is in, ends up in permanent um, sequestration that is lost back to the atmosphere. And there are also uptake from uh, ag practices that contribute to that. And there's also uptake from, um, from coastal um, uh, wetlands too that's included in the 46 uh, million tons. But we, uh, we have a very modest uh, proposed uh, estimated increase in that from afforestation and from um, the silvopasture, which is I think uh, just a few more million tons each. And that- Afforestation would take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and turn it into trees. But the mature trees, where does that all that carbon go uh, if it's a large sink? 
because they also well, respire and give CO2 back. Is that included? While they're while they're growing, they are absorbing more than they're returning to the atmosphere. And then some of it goes into their soil. So um, yeah, Jackie Mohan and uh, Puneet Duvidi from University of Georgia need to answer those questions. And I could- Okay, send me the paper later, yeah. Yeah. But it does have to do with what kinds of trees you're talking about too. So, you know, loblolly pines is one of their favorites. Some do better than others. So um, part of it is the rate of growth, but the uptake too, levels. Foliage, et cetera. Here's a question for Alan. Um, have you evaluated what happens to stratospheric ozone for all the scenarios? You presented it for one of the later ones. Presumably catalytic destruction would be devastating and the climate impacts due to, sudden, due to a sudden drop in ozone absorption would be problematic. If you, so we have these computer models. If you turn the sun down, that doesn't affect the stratosphere and doesn't destroy ozone. But if you put aerosols into the stratosphere, they serve as surfaces for catalytic destruction of ozone like happens in the ozone hole every spring over Antarctica, but this would happen globally. So we looked at that for scenarios that actually put aerosols in the stratosphere. And it would then uh, result in more UV reaching the surface. Right. Also, but, but also if you destroy ozone, the stratosphere to troposphere a transport of ozone would go down. And so you might have reduction of ozone near the surface in some places. So we have a paper where we looked at those different processes. It de definitely depends on the scenario. And it depends on how much Freon is still left in the stratosphere. If you do this later on in the century when there are fewer chlorine chemicals there, then the impact on ozone depletion would be less. Okay, a question for Marilyn. Uh, why didn't solar water heating make the cut? I think make the cut into your top 20. Um, because electric uh, heat pump water heaters were considered to be a superior option, um, the solar water heater market has grown very slowly in the Southeast. It has had some take up in uh, the state of Florida, but not not much um, further north. I think it's possibly uh, in part, of course, the availability of solar is one limitation, but uh, and and rooftop. Um, but the uh, O and M, you know, op operation maintenance issues and just the messiness of having to deal with it all. So I, I know that it's very powerful in the Caribbean islands and um, perhaps places where the grid is not as dependable, but in the US and particularly the Southeast, uh, these high efficiency solar systems seem far superior. So heat pump water heaters are a big part of our retrofitting solution. And that's where that got, got put. Thank you. Um, just one minute, uh, let's see. So, Professor Robach, my takeaway is the case against geoengineering uh, slash albedo modification is conclusive, but I'm guessing there are counter arguments. What are they and why are they wrong? Well, if we're ever going to do stratospheric geoengineering, we have to work as hard as we can on mitigation. All the solutions that Marilyn gave and, uh, and transforming our whole energy structure to running on wind and solar, which is uh, without using the atmosphere as a sewer for our CO2. And an increasing carbon tax will go, which is returned to the people, they call it a fee and dividend, as Jim Hansen puts it, would be, I think would be a, go, a long way to help solve that. Nevertheless, there is going to be a certain amount of, uh, of warming that's going to take place no matter how hard we work on mitigation. And so the argument would be, Let's shave off the worst impacts of global warming by doing a little bit of SRM while we figure out how to stop emitting CO2 and other greenhouse gases and, and then how to take it out of the atmosphere. And the question is, would that be more dangerous or less dangerous than not doing it? 
Thank you, Alan. So uh, a question for Marilyn. What has already been done or is intended to be done to get messages from your project findings, for example, economic cost benefit comparisons um, out to decision makers and the general public? Well, um, the talk today uh, with all of you is really the first public talk I have given on um, this subject. And I'm also giving one at two o'clock today uh, in Georgia, and it's been widely publicized. So I'm hoping we we'll get a lot of stakeholders from across the state. Um, we are working with agencies. We really have done a, a big uh, outreach um, effort through from the beginning until now. And we do have a very nice website. I hope you'll take a look at Drawdown, uh, Georgia, D draw down GA. Oh, actually, um, yeah, it should be on this last slide, but it's not, darn. Um, it is a fantastic website. Take a look, it's just just gorgeous. You saw the pretty color scheme I was using today, This that peachy color. Mm -hmm. That's uh, all part of a, a, a um, professional communications company's take on what would communicate well in Georgia. So we are into the kind of mode now, just beginning really with today's here at uh, AGU and um, at Georgia Tech with the four universities speaking this afternoon in, in about um, 45 minutes. <laughs> I'd also like to remind everybody that there's an election in 13 days and that's how you can influence the what the public, what the public policymakers do about this problem. Yeah. Oh, a very good reminder. Thank you, Alan. So I think with this, we're going to have to bring it to a close. Uh, but I'd like to thank both of our speakers. And I think that uh, they're both probably willing. I know Alan said he would make his uh, presentation available. And if you contact Marilyn, she probably will too. But I believe in a, within a week, this webinar is going to be available on video. I put, the, I put the link to my talk in an answer to one of the questions. So if anybody can look at it there, I send it to everybody. But I, I'll send it to you, Ellen, also, and you can send it out. All Would right. you send me, Ellen, while you're doing that? Thank you. All right. Hey, it's been fun. Enjoy this uh, one side and the other side combination. We could go on for much longer, I think. And very oh, yes. Well, yeah, yeah. definitely we have a lot of silver buckshot in our in our pouch. We just have to get people to believe it will what will work and get some action and go vote. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all very much. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Bye.